Hi there. Uh, my name is Hassan Salam, and today I'm going to talk to you about the evaluation and preparation of any couple embarking on assisted reproduction, being it IVF or ICSI. Uh, please put on your headphones or attach the speakers for a better quality of sound. Now, the first thing, of course, to do with this couple is to counsel them properly. And to counsel them, these are 10 points. You may even have a checklist that you'd like to do uh, to uh, uh, check each one of them. The first thing to do in the counseling is to explain the indication and why the couple are advised to have this particular procedure, being it IVF, ICSI, with or without any uh, attached uh, techniques like assisted hatching, like uh, BGTA, and so on. The second thing is to explain the procedure. Uh, what does it entail? Why do they have to have basic tests? And then uh, how the, the stimulation protocol will work, the monitoring of the protocol, uh, the uh, oocyte retrieval, uh, how the semen sample is to be taken, if there are any problems with the husband in providing the semen sample, uh, if he needs to have a testicular biopsy rather than a semen sample, and what does it entail, uh, what's the difference between IVF and ICSI in the laboratory, then the embryo transfer procedure, and then if we uh, need be to have embryo freezing, and also if uh, one is going to, uh, to have, uh, if the couple is going to have uh, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, this should also be explained. Uh, then uh, we should move to explain the results. And that the results are not 100% because some people think that it is a 100% procedure uh, and why the, the results are, uh, are not 100% and what uh, sorts of results are expected for each, uh, each uh, bracket or each particular uh, group of patients. Then we, may, we move to the explaining the possible complications and that there is a possibility of having ovarian hyperstimulation, particularly in patients with polycystic ovary syndrome. It could be a multiple pregnancy, infection, bleeding, and so on, and uh, to tell them that this is a, um, a slim com, uh, possibility, but it is always there. Uh, then we move to discussing the weight of the patient, if, if it has any impact on the, the results. Uh, then uh, talk about smoking, alcohol, and any uh, drugs that the patient is taking, and how this would affect the result of the procedure. Then, uh, whether they have current diseases, uh, the, 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 the female partner in particular, and whether she's on any medication that needs to be um, adjusted or uh, suspended or continued uh, during the procedure. Then, if there are any allergies uh, for, uh, uh, that would interfere with our procedure, and if the patient is going to have anesthesia during oocyte retrieval, then the anesthetist should know about these allergies. Uh, and then, of course, uh, one, one should do a psychological evaluation of uh, uh, the couple and whether in case of failure they would accept um, uh, the, the failure and what is going to happen because some people may, uh, may run into psychological problems if they don't achieve a pregnancy. And finally, uh, we may like to discuss the cost and finances if, we are, if the patients are going to be uh, paying anything uh, towards the procedure. Uh, having uh, done the counseling, then we should proceed to evaluate the IVF couple. And this includes five steps really. There are laboratory assays, then there is a cervical swab, uh, ultrasonography, then we may uh, we uh, should do a mock embryo transfer, and then if there is any indication for doing a hysteroscopy. So let's start them one by one. And these are the laboratory assays uh, which need to be done prior to IVF. And they include the hormonal assays, the semen analysis, the routine assays, and the assays for sexually transmitted diseases, and then re assays related to uh, uh, any current disease that the, the couple or the, pa uh, the, the patient in particular, the female partner, uh, uh, has. So let's start by the hormonal assays. Hormones that may be done uh, at this stage are the AMH, the, FS, uh, the FSH, the inhibin B, and estradiol. These are the hormones that people um, um, traditionally used to, to, uh, to do. Uh, but really, what is important now is to do the AMH and maybe also the FSH. Inhibin B and estradiol 
have shown that they don't really have uh, uh, an important value uh, in these patients. And why do we do these hormonal assays? Uh, the AMH and the FSH in particular, the AMH. Now, the first thing is to predict uh, the response of the patients, whether it's going to be a poor responder or she's going to be a normal responder or a hyper responder. Because if she's going to be a poor, if we expect her to be a poor responder, then we should start by the appropriate stimulation protocol as we uh, know from our experience. Or she, we may expect her to be a hyper responder, in which case she may be liable to very hyper stimulation and then we may need to freeze the uh, embryos and then uh, so we should be uh, prepared for this. Um, uh, and then choose, of course, the appropriate stimulation protocol for these hyperresponders, and then maybe we would like to increase the frequency of the visits. So this is the importance of doing these hormonal assays. And this is a study by Alazemi Italia, who uh, it's a comparative study between uh, four different predictors, trying to see which one of them can is better in predicting the poor response. And as you can see. AMH is the best predictor, it's much better than F FSH and the inhibin B and even the H. So MHH, A AMH, really, anti-mullerian hormone, is really the best uh, predictor of poor response. And as you can see here, they have a cutoff point of 1.36. And the Embroer Italia tried actually, in this meta-analysis of studies, they tried to compare the predictive value uh, of poor response and this is a comparison between AMH and, F and AFC, the antrophological count, and as you can see, they are really nearly the same in predicting poor response, a good curve. However, if you are trying to predict pregnancy, this is different. These things, these parameters are not good for predicting pregnancy. And why? Because pregnancy depends on other factors. Uh, you may have the, a good patient, you may be using the proper protocol and everything, but then the patient does not become pregnant because you had a problem in embryo transfer, we had a problem in the laboratory. Uh, the individual receptivity of this particular patient is not very good, therefore she does not become pregnant, not because she had the wrong protocol or not because AMH is not a good predictor of response, no, because uh, pregnancy is a multifactorial uh, issue. So therefore, if you want to use AMH and AFC to predict response, yes, but if you want to use them to predict pregnancy, no, you are not going to achieve this. And again, as you can see, here is the paper of Al-Azimi, as you can see, where we saw that AMH was a good predictor of poor response. Now, it is not a good predictor of clinical pregnancy, as well as FSH and inhibin B and H also. And what Lamarck and Zunkar have tried to do is to individualize the stimulation protocol based on AMH. They took two studies from the literature, the Nelson study and the Yates study, and uh, nearly the same idea. If we look at the left panel, the Nelson Italia study, uh, what happened is that uh, Nelson Italia and Lamarck and Zunkar tried to uh, use these algorithms to develop uh, what I said was an individualized approach. Uh, if the MH is uh, quite low, it is, if it is less than 1, then maybe we should use the modified natural cycle. If it is between 1 and 5, uh, then it is still uh, a, a poor response. Then maybe we should increase the dose of FSH to 300 international units of FSH per day and use the antagonist protocol. If it is between 5 and 15, this is the normal response that we would expect from most of our patients, in which case maybe we can use the agonist protocol and then uh, give three and post 225 uh, international units of FSH. And if, if, the, if the AMH are above 15, then we expect a high response. Uh, we're afraid of having multiple pregnancy, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation, in which case we should really use the antagonist protocol and then just give two imposed of FSH uh, so that is 150 international units. This is what Lamarca and Sunkara um, uh, proposed. Uh, and when they, what they did, in fact, uh, they said, okay, if you if we have uh, the MH and if we know the uh, the MH and we also know the FSH 
uh, on day three of the cycle and we know the age of the patient and then uh, on by using this nomogram we can determine the starting dose of FSH which is here in uh, blue and which is 150 if you look carefully it's 150 international units per day so this should be our starting dose this was what they proposed but does it work the short answer is no this is Allegra Italia this they tried to use this uh, nomogram uh, so uh, they compared 99 patients with no nomogram and 92 patients with nomogram and the answer is that the clinical pregnancy rate was the, the same and also the implantation rate and the fertilization rate so it seems that this um, uh, nomogram does not really uh, give us a better uh, results uh, another study which reached the same conclusion was the study by Anders uh, Novo Anderson, as you can see, Professor Anderson uh, from Denmark. And as you can see here, uh, they, this was a study based on AMH again. They used the base AMH uh, to de determine the uh, amount of FSH used. And as you can see, the conclusion in the lower panel optimizing ovarian response in IVF by individualizing the dose result in similar efficacy and improved safety compared with uh, conventional ovarian stimulation so there is no advantage really in using AMH as um, um, uh, to, uh, to determine uh, the better uh, protocol uh, and this is uh, the same study as you can see yes you can uh, predict the poor response you can predict the number of oocytes you can receive, but not really. But you cannot predict the pregnancy rate or the ongoing implantation rate or live birth rate, as we said in the beginning, because these outcomes depend on many other things like, uh, other than your just stimulation protocol. The second test is the semen analysis. And as you can see from this table, these are the WHO reference values, which keep changing every few years. And the last one we are using up till now is the uh, 2010, the fifth edition, as you can see, where uh, the um, total count uh, cutoff point is 39 million per milliliter and a motility of 40% with a progressive motility of 32% and street morphology of uh, um, uh, the cutoff point of 4%. Uh, percent. But what should we look into the semen analysis? What is really important? Is the count important? Is the motility important? Is street morphology important? Are other things also important? Now, one person who tried to make sense of all this was Professor Willem Umbelet. He used the IOI model, intratron insemination model. And what he found is that as long as you're um, doing your insemination with more than 1 million motile sperm which have more than four percent strict morphology your results are going to be the same but if your strict morphology is less than four percent then your results are going to start diminishing so strict morphology seems to be very important and this is again uh, what he found as you can see in subgroup one where he had um, a strict morphology of less than four and this is what he found we did something uh, else we looked at the IVF model because as we said IOI model in the IOI model that Willem Umbelet have used you have other factors you may have problem during the insemination protocol itself uh, you may have um, a different stimulation response uh, and so on but we looked at the IVF, in particular, the fertilization rate. We said, what is the function of the sperm? The function of the sperm is to fertilize the egg. So let's go for the fertilization rate. And this is what we did. We did multiple regression analysis to see which one of these uh, parameters is really important. And to cut a long story short, the two important parameters were the sperm velocity and the strict morphology. And when we divided our patients in the dose 
who had less than 50% fertilization and those who had more than 50% fertilization of the, the oocytes. Again, it was the same result. The sperm velocity and the strict morphology, as you can see here, were the two parameters which are really important in achieving fertilization. So really, when we look at the sperm analysis with the semen analysis, we should really uh, see the motility and then the strict morphology. And in fact, we actually came up with a formula where you can know the expected fertilization rate if you know the sperm velocity and the percentage of strict morphology. And this is important. Why? Because according to this semen analysis, uh, you are going to decide your procedure. For example, if the patient has oligo or tirator or sinospermia altogether, then we may decide for ICSI from the very beginning. But if the patient has normal semen analysis, and they have been, and the couple have been trying for many years, so what we would expect, uh, what we would call them uh, unexplained infertility, then in this case, uh, my advice is to divide the oocyte into two, or at least have some of these oocytes having IVF to know exactly if there is a problem in the fertilization, fertilizing capacity of the sperm. The sperm may be, may be, may look good, but it may have a problem in achieving uh, fertilization. So in order to uh, prevent uh, the possibility of uh, total fertilization failure, so in this case, maybe we'd like to divide our oocytes into some for IVF and some for ICSI. Uh, then, if of course we have erospermia, uh, we don't, I think, have another choice other than have testicular uh, uh, sperm extraction, testicular biopsy, for example, and do ICSI with this. Uh, total absence of motility. Uh, sometimes people say, well, we have total absence of motility, we're going to have a semen sample and then look, maybe we have one or two motile sperm. But I think most of our andrology colleagues would advise us in this case to take a biopsy from the testis uh, better because usually the sperm is better when it's produced in the testis and it can deteriorate more and more uh, throughout its journey along the epididymis uh, until it is ejaculated. Now, if you have pyospermia, or you have um, a certain amount of uh, increased amount of white blood cells, then in this case, maybe we would go for the purple gradient in, or in our preparation of the sperm. And if we have time, maybe we would opt for antibiotics for our uh, patient. And then finally, if we have increased viscosity of the seminal um, uh, in the semen sample, then uh, we could give the husband mucolytics, for example, and antibiotics, because uh, many of these cases are actually due to infection, and this is why the uh, sperm is visit. And then alert our colleagues in the laboratory, because they have their own tricks in um, uh, treating uh, the viscosity in the semen sample when they are going to do the IVF or the ICSI. The third test, uh, the third group of tests, I should say, are the routine clinical chemistry and hematological assays. And this includes a complete blood picture, urine analysis, liver function tests, kidney function tests, blood glucose, and then maybe a coagulation profile. So complete blood count, the way you normally would look at the hemoglobin, and then if the hemoglobin is low, then we would look to the other parameters, and maybe we should advise the patient to uh, have a uh, um, to go to a hematologist and see what is the problem, if there is any anemia and what sort of anemia it is. And then the white blood cells, again, will give us an idea about whether there is any uh, underlying infection uh, in, in the patient. So this is a basic test that everyone really embarking on any operation should have. The second thing is to do a urine analysis. And a urine analysis includes many things, but what impo it's important for us to see if there is any glucose in the urine, if there are any white blood cells in the urine, or if there are any proteins in the urine, uh, because these may denote um, other uh, diseases. Liver function tests, again, there are many liver function tests, but the ones that we really need to do is maybe the alanine transaminase and the aspartate, aspartate transaminase. So the LT and the AST, these are the ones we do. Some people like to add albumin also, but uh, certainly uh, as a screening test, we don't need to, to do the whole lot of tests. 
kidney function tests again, uh, what we usually do is to measure the creatinine and the, uh, the urea and creatinine. Uh, some other people uh, like to measure sodium uh, ions and potassium ions again. But as I say, for routine purposes, there is no need to do all this uh, gamete of tests. Then blood glucose, uh, depending on uh, what time of uh, the day or after fasting that the patient has uh, received uh, her test, if it was a fasting, uh, um, fasting blood sample, then these are the uh, reference values. If she just ate, these are the reference values. And if it uh, has eaten for after uh, since three hours or more, then these are the reference values. Uh, in which case, we may spot the occasional diabetic patient who doesn't know, or the pre-diabetic patients who a patient who should be advised to uh, take care and then maybe consult a diabetologist. And the sixth thing is maybe to is to do a correlation profile. What we usually do is the PT and PTT, the corresponding thrombin time and the APTT test, because they give us an idea about the coagulation of the patient. Some of the patients, as we know, during the ovum collection may have some bleeding, and uh, if the bleed is excessive, it may be that she has a coagulation problem. Some people include also the INR. And again, as I say, uh, for routine purposes, there is no reason to include all these tests. Then we move to the assays for sexually transmitted diseases. And why do we do them? We do them because if the patient is, has any of these diseases, should be treated. And also the heart pattern should be protected or treated. And then we do it also to protect our staff and to prevent contamination in the lab. Particularly if we're going to do crowd preservation, we don't like to put uh, a sample with uh, HIV or hepatitis C uh, with, the others, uh, with the other samples in the same uh, container uh, nutrition, liquid nutrition container. And finally, for medical legal purposes, we don't want the patient to come afterwards and say, well, I've done a test, I am HIV positive, and I think I took it from your operation. So these are the tests. There are antibody tests, as you can see, uh, simple tests which can be done in the lab, the HIV test, the hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and the syphilis, as you can see from this uh, test. But these are as of course screening tests and this is what how you should really uh, interpret the results uh, if you have one line it is negative if you have two lines it is positive and if it you have no line then the test is invalid and it has to be uh, repeated but it is only a screening test as we said so you have two lines then uh, presumably the the patient is has the has is a positive is positive for uh, this particular assay. So what should we do? We go for the confirmatory test, which has an RNA um, uh, test. And as you can see here, uh, this uh, algorithm is done for HCV, hepatitis C virus, but it applies to HPV, HCV, and HIV. And as you can see here, so you, uh, as we said in the left panel above, you see serum status for HCV antibody. Uh, uh, so it is un if, if it's negative, then it is negative. But it is reactive. If it is reactive, it is positive. Then we have to confirm it by doing the RNA uh, test. And when we do the RNA, it's either negative or positive. Again, if it is negative, then the patient is negative, definitely. And if it's positive, then the patient should go for treatment. Uh, it's the same idea again for syphilis. Again, the triponemal assay is really the screening test. So if it is negative, then the patient does not have anything. But if it is positive, then it is only a screening test. So we should go for the quantitative uh, RPR test, um, uh, which is the non-triponemal uh, test. And then if it is uh, reactive, then this is active scissors. If it is non-reactive, we should go to another step, which is the alternative, the alternative uh, triponemal test. And again, if it is negative, it is negative. But if it is positive, then the patient either has positive syphilis and present or had a past infection of syphilis. And then finally, we have some assays that we may need to do if the patient has a current disease. For example, we'd like to, if she's diabetic, 
we'd like to know if she is uh, uh, well controlled by doing, for example, the hemoglobin A1C, um, the uh, glycosylated hemoglobin. If she uh, is on thyroid treatment, we may like to check her TSH and then if we needed the T3 and T4 and so on. Then we move to the cervical swab. Um, we would like to, we like usually to do cervical swab to see if there is any infection in the cervix because this may affect the results. Or does it? This is a meta-analysis we did many years ago. And what we found in 2003 is that yes, if the patient has infection, the result, the clinical pregnancy rate is diminished. It's actually diminished to less than half of what uh, we would expect. These are four studies from literature. The Egbasi, the Fonchen, the Moore, and the Salim studies. And the implantation rate also was also diminished if the patient had infection. And how did they check for infection? Either to do a swab, as we uh, mentioned, or to uh, culture the tip of the embryo transfer after doing the embryo transfer. But of course, it's better to do things uh, early. And what uh, Dr. Patrick Egbasi, who is a doctor from Nigeria, but he's working now in Kuwait, what he did many years ago again is that he uh, uh, checked for the infection, and if he found the infection, he gave the antibiotic. And when he did this, he had a better pregnancy rate, as you can see here, from 18.7 to 41.3, and then uh, uh, so uh, if you give in, uh, the antibiotics to the patient who have infection, then you improve the results. But what about giving the, the antibiotics to everybody? Like uh, in this study, uh, the authors gave the treatment to everybody. Everybody had an antibiotic, and either they had infection or no. And the other group did, did not have antibiotics. And they, this was a randomized control trial. And in fact, there was no difference in the implantation rate or the miscarriage rate, in fact. So giving it across the board to everybody does not really uh, help very much. The third thing we should do is an ultrasound evaluation uh, of the patient prior to starting IVF. And with our ultrasound, we can actually check 12 things. Uh, let's look at them one by one. With ultrasound, we should check for uterine anomalies. And the best method of checking for uterine anomalies, of course, is the 3D, 4D ultrasound. As you can see here, the different sorts of uh, anomalies that we can uh, find. And the most important one of them maybe is the uterine septum. But does the uterine septum affect our results? This is the um, ASRM uh, practice committee guidelines. And what do they say? They say that most women with a septate uterus have an efficient reproductive function so that the septate uterus does not affect the results whether they become pregnant or not. So, in general, we should refrain from doing an operation for everybody with a septum because they can still become pregnant and achieve a full-time pregnancy, at least as uh, the guidelines, the SRM guidelines say. Uh, but then, if the patient has repeated miscarriage, for example, or if she has implantation failure, our case, then in this case, we should opt for removing the uterine septum, usually with hysteroscopy. The second thing we should look uh, for by our ultrasound is the uterine position, and whether it is uh, if there is version or flexion, if the uterus antiverted or retroverted. And this is, these are examples of antiverted uterus and retroverted uterus, which we all know. The third thing is to look for the dimensions, the measurements of from the fundus to the internal os, then from the internal os to the external os. So that's the measurement of the body on its own and the cervix of its own, because these are will be important for us in doing our embryo transfer. Uh, because where should we put our embryo? Well, this is a study by Corolo. Uh, if you put your embryo too near to the fundus, that is 10.2 millimeters, yani one centimeter away from the fundus, 
the results were 20%, the implantation rate was 20%. If it was 15 millimeters, it was 31%. If it was 19 millimeters, it was 33%. So uh, one should not be too near to the fundus, uh, at least one and a half centimeters away from the fundus, at least is what this study have found. Another study was done by Pope Italia. Uh, same thing. If beyond the fundus, the results were very bad, at the fundus were a little better, uh, one to five uh, milliliters away from the fundus, and then if it was six to 27 away from the fundus. And what they have done with the regression analysis, they found that for each millimeter the embryos are deposited away from the fundus, the odds of clinical pregnancy increased by 11%. So to cut it short, we really have to stay away from the fundus. The fourth thing we should be uh, doing with our ultrasound is to measure the uterus cervical angle. Because some people have no angle, some people have a, a, a mild angle like uh, the upper right panel, then the lower left panel uh, a more uh, bigger angle, and then uh, lower right angle uh, there is a very acute angle. The uterus is acutely antiverted, and this because this is usually what gives us problems during our embryo transfer. Uh, we studied this and we published it in human reproduction many years ago. And what we actually do is that to bend the tip of our catheter uh, according to this angle. Uh, and as you can see here, these are the, uh, the relationship between the angle and the clinical pregnancy rate. Uh, with the more the angle is large, uh, with the more uh, the clinical pregnancy rate is affected. So if it was no angle 36%, small angle 35%, moderate angle 71%, but it was large angle, it was only 17%. Uh, again, the other thing to do is to do the antral follicle count. And as you can see here, in the upper panel, uh, this is a poor um, AFC count, Middle panel, this is the average AFC count, and the lower panel is a, a higher AFC count. Because according to Qui, uh, now the cutoff point is six. We really uh, like to have at least five uh, um, follicles, small follicles, in each ovary. Uh, because if we have more than 15 also, uh, so we risk uh, to have a hyper response which with all its associated hyperstimulation, or very hyperstimulation syndrome, multiple pregnancy, and so on. So really, the right number is anything between 5 and 15 uh, oocytes in both ovaries. And again, Lamarck and Sunkara have used these uh, data to in trying to individualize uh, the uh, stimulation protocol. Again, uh, they said if you, we have the AFC, and if we have the day 3 FSH, and we have the age, we can uh, determine the starting dose of FSH, uh, which is in blue here, as you can see, which is about 150 international units per, per, per day. That's two ampoules uh, per day. But again, does it work? This is another study by uh, Theodora van Tilburg. Uh, this is uh, the, the so-called Optimist study, and again, uh, they used the AFC as their method to determine the stimulation protocol or uh, the amount of FSH used. And again, as you can see, again, as you can see in the lower panel, the conclusion was that the AFC-based individualized FSH dosing does not improve the labor rate or reduce the cost as compared to the standard FSH dose. What it can do is to diminish the incidence of ovarian hyperstimulation. So it predicts, it can predict the hyperresponders. You can do something about the hyperresponders, but very little really with the poor responders, because what can you gain from um, uh, flogging a horse which is already very tired? And again, this is the same study. This is the cumulative pregnancy rate using the, the AFC-based uh, um, protocol or uh, FC-based uh, algorithm. 
and again uh, this is a broad comparing the AMH and the FC and as you can see they are really nearly the same so AMH is as good as AFC really in predicting the poor response AF AMH as you can see here has a very little edge over AFC because if I look at hyper response then AFC has a very little edge over AMH but both of them are the same in predicting poor response or hyper response the other thing that we should be doing with our ultrasound is to measure the ovarian volume because again ovarian volume helps us in our uh, prediction of hyper response in particular and as you can see here yes the ovarian volume and uh, can it predict ovarian hyperstimulation yes as you can see uh, if you look at the ovarian volume uh, if the ovarian volume uh, was uh, you know, the patients who the eight patients who had ovarian hyperstimulation versus the 86 who were the controls who did not have ovarian hyperstimulation the ovarian volume was 13.2 in the OHSS group and only 8.9 in the control group the seventh thing is to look for uh, um, to study the uterine cavity okay, on the right side we have a normal uterine cavity but we can have endometrial polyps we can have intrauterine synechia uh, adhesions or we can have intrauterine fluid let's have a look these are polyps on the left this is a 4d uh, picture of a polyp which is very clear uh, on the right side uh, we can uh, have a better picture even by uh, infusing uh, infusing saline so like a sono uh, uh, hysterography so here uh, saline was injected and then the 4d uh, was taken it can also be done by the t into by the 2d ultrasound uh, so does it affect so should we remove our polyp prior to uh, doing our procedure now we don't have a study uh, on resection of the polyp before IVF but we have this the Cochrane review on removing the intrauterine polyp prior to IUI and if you do this you improve your clinical pregnancy rate but as you can see it's only one study by Therese Medina and what the Cochrane review people are saying is that we need more studies to do the same and not only for IUI but more importantly for IVF and intrauterine synechia is something else that we can see of course with our 4d ultrasound and again uh, if we are not very sure we should do a hysterosarcoid geography to confirm the findings the third thing that we can see with our ultrasound is the presence of fluid in the uterine cavity as you can see here so what should we do should we remove aspirate the fluid and that this effect our uh, pregnancy well the short answer is no a van der Gast, what they found is that they had fluid say aspirated the fluid in 66 percent of uh, the patient and the 66 mass control and as you can see here uh, the and uh, they aspirated in uh, 66 and they didn't aspirate of course in the controls and the results were the same the ongoing pregnancy rate was 33 versus 30 no significant difference the fourth thing that we can do with we should do with ultrasound is to look for any fibroids as you can see in these four dimension uh, uh, pictures although of course we can do this with two dimension as you can see in this uh, four uh, uh, pictures the upper left one is a 2d picture and uh, we know we have now our FIGO classification of Leo myometer of course um, the submucosal ones which are zero and one are the one which are really um, very worrisome which can affect our results but then we have anything from two to five which are uh, um, encroaching on the uh, the cavity but uh, six uh, and seven, two to five which are the uh, intramural ones uh, of course number two is likely encroaching on the cavity the number three is just touching the cavity number four is total intramural number five is partly subserosal and then six and seven of course 
uh, more than 50%, number six is more than 50% uh, subcellulosal, and the number seven is totally subcellulosal, pedunculated. So we should look for fibroids and then classify them accordingly. Because what does the ASRM guidelines say? What do they say? 2017. Well, they say that in uh, asymptomatic women with cavity distorting myomas, hysteroscopic uh, resection may be considered. Hysteroscopic or laparoscopic, of course. Otherwise, if it's non cavity distorting, it is not advised to do any operation. The other thing to look for are ovarian cysts. Now we can see this by these two dimensional ultrasound. There is a large cyst, which is a simple cyst, as we call it, because it is clear and there is nothing inside. And what does the Cochrane review say? Should we do aspiration? Right, right there. Uh, and the short answer is that is no. There is insufficient evidence to say that drainage of the functional ovarian cyst improves any of the following. It does not improve the live birth rate, the clinical pregnancy rate, the number of follicles recruited, or the number of oocytes collected. So the findings do not provide any supporting evidence for <coughs> this approach, uh, so for this uh, drainage. So there is no point of draining them. Maybe during the operation, we can during the oocyte retrieval, we can um, aspirate the follicle uh, at the same time and maybe um, analyze the contents but certainly not if this cyst is an endometriosis cyst because this can um, induce a tube ovarian abscess because we aspirate the contents the contents are full of blood and then it, everything in the vagina will run inside and this will produce an infection if this happens accidentally meaning that if we have um, drained or tapped an endometriosis cyst endometrioma accidentally during our oocyte collection we should give the patient an umbrella of antibiotics in order to prevent any tube ovarian abscess formation hydrosalpings is something else that can be seen by our ultrasound and this is how it shows on ultrasound, uh, the uh, 2D pictures, and then we have the 4D on the right lower panel. So, does an ultrasound and hydrosalping affect our results? And the short answer is yes. This is a paper from Camus a long time ago. He found that, yes, if you have hydrosalpings, the pregnancy rate is lower, implantation rate is lower, delivery rate is lower, and the pregnancy loss is higher. So what is the answer? The answer came with Dr. Uh, Strandell. What did she do? She said we should remove the hydrosalpings. And if we do this, your delivery rate is going to improve. And this is what he show, she showed in this randomized control trial. And more importantly, when it was a bilateral hydrosalpings, things were even more clearer. The implantation rate was improved, pregnancy rate was improved, and delivery rate was improved. So the, what we should do really, if we have bilateral hypocent binges, we should remove them or at least uh, obliterate them or uh, close the uh, fallopian tube. And this is what the Cochrane review says, that laparoscopic salpingectomy after IVF increases the pregnancy rate and the live birth rate. There are no changes in the implantation rate, ectopic pregnancy, miscarriage, but what is important for us, of course, is the live birth rate. Uh, not only if we have hydrosalpings, because the show Italia showed in this paper that even if you don't have a hydrosalping, if you have severe tubal factor infertility, and if you remove the tube, you have better implantation and better pregnancy uh, rate. The other thing we can see by our ultrasound is adenomyosis. And as you can see here, we can also do a Doppler study if we are expecting adenomyosis. The best method, of course, is an, an MRI. And this is how 
uh, adenomyosis uh, shows on an MRI uh, examination. But does adenomyosis affect our clinical rate and the short answer is yes. Yes, adenomyosis diminishes the clinical pregnancy rate as you can see from this meta-analysis by Yunus and uh, Togas Ulandi. It also diminishes our ongoing pregnancy rate, which is more important. So what do we do? Maybe we can give the agonist protocol, but prolonged agonist protocol, two to three months of GnRH agonist before IVF. And if we do this, we may improve uh, the clinical pregnancy rate, but not significantly as is shown in this study. This is a study coming from Park Italia, uh, from uh, Hong Kong. And as you can see, the results, the pregnancy rate increased from 25% to 30%, but it is not significant. Maybe if we increase the numbers, it can become more significant. And in all cases, this is a case control trial. We need really a randomized control trial. And finally, we can look for uh, endometriosis, and in particular endo, uh, endometrioma, as you can see uh, on the left side, seen by 2D ultrasound, and on the right side by 3D, 4D ultrasound. And again, the question is, does endometrioma affect our IVF results? And the short answer is, doesn't seem. No. The live birth rate in these five studies, this meta-analysis by Hamdan Italia, there was no change in the live birth rate. There was no change in the clinical pregnancy rate. There was a change in the number of oocytes received. You receive fewer oocytes, but the uh, results are the same. Because some people advocated doing surgery, and if you do surgery, do you improve your live birth rate? No. Do you improve your clinical pregnancy rate? No. And do you increase the number of oocytes? No. Because in fact, when you do your operation, you are bound to remove some part of the ovarian tissue if you are doing it just plain surgery or over laparoscopy. But usually, people do cauterization. And when they do cauterization or ablation of the wall of the endometrioma, uh, this affects the ovarian reserve uh, and, and, and a, in a very substantial way. The fourth thing to do uh, for preparing our uh, patient for IVF or uh, ICSI is to do a mock embryo transfer, also called a trial embryo transfer or a dummy embryo transfer. And why do we do a dummy embryo transfer? Because we don't like to go for the true embryo transfer and then uh, finding that it turns out to be a difficult transfer. Because the question is, does a difficult transfer affect our uh, results? And the short answer is yes. This is the pre pre clinical pregnancy rate in difficult transfer versus easy transfers. As you can see, difficult transfers, the clinical pregnancy rate is significantly diminished. The implantation rate is also significantly diminished. So what do we do in our dummy embryo transfer or mock embryo transfer? We measure the length of the uterine cavity and the cervical canal, as you said. We look at the direction of the uterine cavity and the cervical canal. We evaluate the uterovical angulation, as we said before, and we use this to choose the most suitable catheter. Then try, do our embryo, our mock embryo transfer, and then to, dis to discover any difficulty. Sometimes you have a pinpoint external loss, or we find a cervical polyp or fibroid which cannot be seen by ultrasound or which have, has to be negotiated during our, our transfer. Uh, there could be, again, an anatomical distortion of the cervix uh, due to a previous surgery or a congenital anomaly. And again, we really need to know how to negotiate it during our um, um, definitive embryo transfer. And see or mark whether the transfer is easy or not. And then the necessity of instrumentation. We may need to decide to do a DNC or even a hysteroscopic uh, 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 dilatation of the cervix before going for the actual transfer. And this is the diagram that we can use when we do our mock trial embryo transfer. As you can see, uh, it tells us where the uterus is antiverted, retroverted, axial, uh, whether you should go up then down or down then up, uh, and whether 
the uterus is tilted to the patient's right or to the patient's left, or whether there is an anterior ridge or posterior ridge, so that we can remember this during the uh, definitive embryo transfer. And again, uh, we can we can decide to bend the catheter according to the uterus of Langs, which we should really do. And these are different catheters, of course, and each of them uh, can be tilted, or some of them do not have a tilt, so we may use a different catheter, uh, which we can tilt uh, as we like. And does it work? Well, this is an endomized control trial conducted many years ago by Dr. Agar Mansour, a group in Cairo. And as you can see, uh, at that time they said that pregnancy, she said that pregnancy rate was imp improved and the implantation rate was improved. But as you can see, this was 1990, 30 years ago, and as you can see, the pregnancy rate was 22 if you use the dummy embryo transfer versus 13, and these are low results. Things have changed, of course, uh, uh, very much uh, nowadays. Because Henny and Milk found in 2004 that the uterus can change its position. For example, if you look at the left uh, panel, we find that uh, they started with 323 uh, uteri which were anti-verted. And then when they came to the actual embryo transfer, 2% uh, of them had uh, reverted to being uh, retroverted. And uh, when they had uh, 213 retroverted uteri, when they came at the actual, on the day of the actual embryo transfer, 55% of them became antiverted and only 45% remained antiverted. So the uterus can change in po its position uh, from the time when you do the mock embryo transfer to the time when you do your actual embryo transfer. So it is something to bear in mind, but in any case, uh, I think embryo, uh, uh, dummy embryo transfer can uh, help us uh, in difficult points, particularly in negotiating the utero cervical uh, angle. And now we come to hysteroscopy uh, and whether we should do hysteroscopy or not before starting uh, any uh, IVF. And uh, the accepted wisdom nowadays is that we should not really be doing hysteroscopy for everybody before uh, starting uh, uh, IVF. We should only do it if we want to confirm a lesion suspected by 3D or 4D. If we find by 3D or 4D there's a polyp or there's a nick or anything, yes, we should do a hysteroscopy to clarify things and to remove any uh, poly, for example. And the second thing is to remove a lesion which is thought to interfere with implantation, as I say, uh, either to confirm or to uh, remove any lesion suspected. And these are the lesions which uh, may need us to do uh, hysteroscopy to uh, deal with them. Uh, but the question is, should we be doing a routine hysteroscopy for everybody before the first IVF cycle? And the short answer is no. Because as you can see here from this prospective randomized control trial, it was a multi-center trial, in fact, by Smith Italia, the INSIGHT study. Uh, they uh, had uh, in their two arms of the study 370 odd patients, and they found that the result was exactly the same. So there is no point really of doing routine hysteroscopy for everybody before the first cycle of uh, treatment. Um, the other question is, should we do it then for repeated implantation failure? Now, this is a randomized control trial which was conducted many years ago by Gurkhan and Demirot, and they divided their uh, 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 patients into three groups. Group one with repeat, they all had repeated implantation failure, but group one had no hysteroscopy before proceeding to a further uh, cycle of treatment. Group two, they had hysteroscopy, no pathology was found. Group three, they had hysteroscopy and pathology was found that was removed. And what we can see from the results is that yes, when you do hysteroscopy, whether there was a pathology or no pathology, you improve your results. And the idea was they said maybe just expanding the uterus with the fluid uh, can remove any possible adhesions or that we are doing individual scratching or whatever uh, 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 mechanism is working. Uh, another study was done in India two years later by Ramo, uh, Ramarajo Italia and they found the same thing. And Makrakis and Pantos conducted the meta-analysis based on these two studies and found that yes, hysteroscopy and repeated implantation failure is beneficial. It includes, increases your uh, clinical pregnancy rate. 
uh, but people in the Arctic Kingdom were a bit suspicious, so they conducted a prospective randomized multi central study, and this was by Tare Tuchi Italia. And what they found is that when you randomize your patient properly, even those who had repeated implantation failure and you either do hysteroscopy or no hysteroscopy, there was absolutely no difference, as you can see here 29% versus 29%. Uh, the question, of course, is, okay, so what should we do with these patients? But we have to remember that in all these patients treated in the UK, all these patients had a 4D, 3D, 4D ultrasound properly done by experienced people, and they could not see anything in the uterine cavity. So the question is whether you have a very good uh, 4D uh, machine and operator uh, to look carefully inside the uterus or whether you need to do hysteroscopy uh, after repeated implantation failure. But certainly routine hysteroscopy uh, before the first cycle of treatment is out of the question. So in conclusions, ladies and gentlemen, preparing the couple embarking on IVF should include proper counseling, then the laboratory tests which we have discussed, a cervical mucus swab for culture and sensitivity, and if there's infection, we treat. An ultrasound, preferably a 3D ultrasound, uh, 3D, 4D ultrasound, to look at the different uh, items we have enumerated. Then to do a mock or a trial embryo transfer. And finally, only hysteroscopy in selected cases. And with this, I come to the end of my presentation, and I would like to thank you very much for your attention.